Ba-da-da. Every time, sorry. <laughs> I've seen it like a hundred times. Hey, John Safira, y'all doing all right this morning? Everybody okay today? We good? We good? I mean, come on. Uh, we're grateful to see you guys. Want to welcome everyone in our sanctuary right now. Also, those of you who are watching from home or wherever you are, we're so grateful to have you. I, I just, I don't know why I felt led to say this morning. I, just, I love Sundays at John's Ferry. I, I just love to see your smiling faces. I love to watch you serve the body of Christ. I love to watch you worship, um, your attentiveness to the Word of God. And then, of course, I, I'm, I know that you go out and you live the way of Jesus throughout the week. And uh, we just love you guys. Just love everything that God's doing here. So excited. This is a great season to be here. Maybe you're new today and uh, you're gonna hear more and more about where we're headed as a church. Today, we're gonna celebrate life change at the end of our services. And all four of our services today, we're ending them all with baptism. And that's awesome to think about life change. And so we're, we'll wrap it up in the best possible way uh, through baptism today. But this is a series we're looking at where we're building on the rich, rich history of what God has done through many of you here at Johnson Ferry and looking towards the future with a new mission and a new vision. Of course, the mission is the Great Commission. That's not new. But we're using different language that I think articulates better where people understand where our culture is. And, and this is the new mission statement that we put forth uh, last week to you as a church family. Uh, that we exist to help people find three really important things. In fact, if you would just in both rooms say them with me, that'd be great. We exist to help people find what? Truth, longing, and purpose in Jesus. Yeah, and the most important words are the last two, in Jesus. We believe those things are only fully and finally found in the person of Jesus. And if that's our mission to help people find that, well, we want to build upon a few you know, and build into some really strategic initiatives over the next five years. So we put some numbers in front of you last week. And again, the numbers are, are goals for us. Goals are not God's. Goals can change. But these are the numbers that we're pursuing over the next five years. What are they? Uh, we want to see, first of all, 1,000 relational disciple makers created. We're going to talk about that today. We want to see two additional campuses started over the next five years. I'll share more about that next week. And then finally, we want to see 35 of you uh, being sent out to unreached peoples all over the world. And we'll talk about that in a few, a few weeks. But if our mission is to help people find truth, belonging, and purpose, and those are only found in Jesus, it means that we have to live a certain way with certain values that help us to live out the way of Jesus. So the way we say it is like this. We, we want to be a people of truth. Uh, we want to be a place, yes, a people, but also a place for people to find belonging in Christ. And of course, we wanna help all of you live with purpose, something beyond yourself. But today we're gonna talk about truth. If, if we're helping people find truth in Jesus and we aim to be people of truth, what difference does that make? And what we're gonna talk about today has a lot to do with discipleship and being disciple makers. It corresponds with that goal of creating 1,000 relational disciple makers over the next five years. But it all starts with truth. Uh, we live in a world where there is a battle for truth. There's a lot of different reasons why that is. Some of them are philosophical and the, the worldviews and ideologies that people have. Uh, if you've studied philosophy, which I'm assuming most of us haven't, but if you've looked in it, you know that over the last few decades, we're in an age that many philosophers call an age of postmodernism. so it follows modernism. I won't get into all what that means. But now we're shifting into more what some are calling meta-modernism, uh, which incorporates some of the global dynamic, uh, you know, catalyzed by the internet. But, but a long story short, most people believe there is no such thing as absolute truth. There's no such thing as objective truth. There's what's true to you and based on your part of the world that you grew up in or based on your opinion or fact, uh, but they don't believe in a sense of one absolute truth that governs all things. And we live in an age of desire, of will, of, of feelings, of, of wanting things to be true, whether they can be true or not. Like for instance, um, you, you might want to fly. You might feel like you could fly. You might jump on the roof of your building this afternoon and try to fly, but you are gonna run up against a truth called gravity that will uh, prove a point, that there are uh, absolute truths that we are all governed by. And, and how does that shape us as followers of Jesus? 
Some people live, say we live in an age of truth decay. Many of you go to the dentist. Well, I hope you go to the dentist, right? Uh, and your dentist looks at your teeth. You know, do we have tooth decay? Well, maybe we're dealing with truth decay, uh, an, an era where people confuse fact with opinion, an, an era where people are volatile about our opinions and facts, and we blur those things together. And people just think, well, there, there's just no such thing as truth anymore. It's just your opinion. And, and it comes out in all kinds of ways. I, I tweeted this yesterday. You know, Apple has this new set of emojis, and it's, hey, it's their company, their phones, I guess they can put whatever they want on them. Um, but one of their new emojis is of a pregnant man. Now, that's what we call in grammar an oxymoron. You know what that is? Um, now, now, men can help raise kids, and they should. Men love children. Men nurture children. Men help challenge children. All, men do all that. But a guy can't have a child. Did y'all know that? I don't know if that's newsflash to you, right? But that, that, that is truth. That is truth. Well, we follow uh, Jesus who, who says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And, and how does that shape how we view truth and how we view reality? And more importantly for ministry, how are we disciples of his who are seeking truth and disciple makers who are helping others to seek him and his truth? So what I'm gonna do with you today in my time with you, I want us to look at this idea of discipleship. That's a word we throw around a lot. It's a churchy word. If you're not a, you know, you're not, if you're new to this whole thing, you're not even a follower of Jesus yet, you you only probably hear that word at church, disciple. And it probably means different things to different people. Um, I am passionate about disciple making because I have seen the difference it has made in my life and the lives of others. When uh, I was in college, I, I didn't walk with Jesus most of my college experience until my senior year. And I had a couple guys who I would say discipled me. We didn't use that word, but there was a very intentional process that helped me um, grow exponentially in my faith. And that's what we want for you, to not just be a disciple, but to be like those guys were to me, disciple makers in a more intentional way. So let's look at how Jesus made disciples. Let's look at what a disciple is, and then we'll, and then we'll think about some next steps to helping us become disciple makers. And uh, we gave you these books last week. Hopefully you got one when you came in today or brought yours from last week, and there's a place you can take sermon notes. And the end of my time with you, I'm actually gonna point out one of the pages in here that gives you some next steps uh, for what to do with today's message. All right, let's dive right in. Matthew chapter four. Matthew chapter four, we're gonna look at verses 18 through 22. So if you have a copy of God's word, please open it and let's all stand together, both rooms and at home in your den. Let's stand together right now. Matthew chapter four. And we see here the calling of four of Jesus's original disciples in Matthew chapter four. We'll look at verses 18 through 22. Now, as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and his brother Andrew, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of people. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately, they left the boat and their father and followed him. Let's pray together. Father, as we look into your word now, like Peter, like Andrew, like James, like John, would we immediately follow you and to become the people you want us to be? We love you, Jesus. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen. You guys have a seat. So here Jesus calls out uh, four of his original disciples. They're fishermen. Lest you think they're just out there, you know, fishing for a hobby or to take a break from a busy life. This this is their job. And and for all we know, they're, they're good at their job. Maybe they make a decent living 
at their job. They're running a fishing operation. This is a business. These are four young businessmen. And Jesus calls them to be his disciples. And of course, as we read the story, there's four verses. It's like he says, hey, follow me. And then they just drop their nets and they go to follow him. But if you read Luke chapter five, which is a parallel passage, it, it may fill in some of the gap there because right before Jesus calls them, he does a great miracle. This is the time when Jesus looked at these guys who had been fishing all night, caught nothing, and he says, go back out there, put, throw your net over again to the side, just one more time. And either because they're being nice to him or they had heard of his reputation as a miracle worker or what, whatever the motive was, they go back out and they throw the, the net over the side. And of course, they haul in this huge haul of fish. They had to call another boat over to come and help them. And, and so then, then Jesus says, follow me. And seeing the power, seeing Jesus for who he is, they drop everything and they follow him. They're near the Sea of Galilee. Galilee was a place where lots of Gentiles lived in addition to Jewish people. So we get a sense that Jesus is coming for all people, Jews and Gentiles, to be his followers. But if we were to think about discipleship for us as a church, uh, for us as believers today, uh, what do we get from those four short Verses. I think that today we want to camp out on verse 19 because it gives us handles by which we can think about how we can be disciples and not just disciples, but disciple makers. So let's look at that again, verses 19, or just verse 19, where he says, Follow me and I will make you fishers of people. Now, I know people sounds weird if you memorize it as fishers of men, but the idea is that we're going to fish for all people, men and women, all people. That's what, you know, you guys are good at fishing. You know how to catch fish. I want you to take some of those same skills and use them for kingdom purposes in the lives of people. At Johnson Ferry, when we think about discipleship, we use this verse. Now, there are a lot of other great verses in the New Testament that talk about discipleship. This isn't the only one. But in some ways, this verse gives us a wonderful description, a bottom line description of what we aim to be as followers of Jesus and the whole process of making disciples. Here's the definition I would give you today. When I think about being a disciple, particularly from Matthew 4, 19, it is this. A disciple is following Jesus, being changed by the Spirit, and committed to the mission of God. Simple to understand. But let me say it again, a disciple is following Jesus, being changed by the Spirit, and committed to the mission of God. Now, a couple of things are important in that verse. One, I think it follows the, the flow of verse 19. Jesus said, follow me, I will make you, I'm gonna turn you into something. What is that something? A fisher of men. But seeing as how we serve a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, when we think about discipleship, it needs to be very Trinitarian. Yes, we're following Jesus, we're being changed by his spirit, and we're committed to the mission of God. And that's what we wanna look at today. How can we better be those disciples that Jesus longs us to be? So let's, let's do that. Let's just, in a very simple way, I'm gonna give you some lists today. This is a good note-taking day. Um, if you're a note-taker, you're gonna love this. If you're not a note-taker, Next week's gonna be awesome too. So number one, a disciple, number one, is following Jesus. All right, very simple, but that's what he said in verse 19. He said, follow me, or your text might say, come and follow me. Uh, the word for disciple is used uh, 264 different times in the Gospels and Acts. And it's the word um, it's often used, the Greek word is often matates. It, it, it can mean lots of things. It, at a basic level, it means student, apprentice, something along those lines. It's this idea of someone who's observing someone else and, and doing it even in their home 24 7. That's what a disciple was for a rabbi. When we think about being a disciple today, there's two themes, if you will, that come up again and again. The first is being, well, a follower. In fact, our definition says the disciple is following Jesus. And Jesus wants us to be his followers. He is both Savior and he is Lord. He, he doesn't want us to come up beside him, you know, like Jesus is my homeboy. What's up, Jesus? How you doing? You know, me and you right here, like where are we going today, you know? He says, no, no, Clay, I want you to get, I want you to get behind me and, and follow me. 
and I am to watch what he does and to observe how he's treating people and to look at the, listen to the words that comes out of his mouth. And I'm, I'm following him. So a disciple is a follower, but a disciple is also a learner. I am to learn things from Jesus. This is where Jesus is separated from maybe the other rabbis of his day. They called Jesus a rabbi, but Jesus wasn't a traditional rabbi. Namely, because of the content that he taught, the Jewish rabbis would teach their disciples um, the law, the Old Covenant, Old Testament law. Jesus, however, wants his disciples to learn his interpretation of the law, his teaching of the law. Here's a good example of that. Uh, In Matthew chapter uh, nine, uh, Jesus is calling the disciple Levi. Sometimes we call him Matthew, the tax collector. And the Pharisees uh, could not stand that Jesus was hanging out with the tax collector and sinners and people that other people, that, you know, religious people would never be around. Why, Why is Jesus, if you're so holy, why are you around these kind of people, right? In Matthew chapter nine, This is what Jesus says to his disciples and to the Pharisees. He said, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. And then he says, now go and learn. Learn what this means. I desire compassion rather than sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. In other words, that's one of many examples where Jesus says, I want you to learn. What does it mean? All right, the law says, I desire sacrifice Uh, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Learn from me, learn from me what that means. At the most basic level, we want to be learning the way of Jesus. And wherever Jesus went, he made disciples. Yes, he spoke to the crowds and he did miracles. But if you think about the timeline of his life, Jesus spent the majority of his time on earth with his most intimate disciples. Um, Yes, the 12 And there were more than 12. We know that at one point he sends out 70 different disciples. But he really spends most of his time with three or four of them, Peter, James, and John. What do we learn about Jesus as a disciple maker? If we we wanna be disciple makers, what do we learn about Jesus as a disciple maker? Here's one of those lists as we'll just breeze through this. But number one, we learn that Jesus called his disciples. In other words, he initiates This process, this is unlike the rabbis of his day who would wait for their disciples kind of come to them. Jesus initiates that relationship. Number two, Jesus, with his disciples, he asks for total and lifelong commitment. Sometimes the Jewish rabbis would want their disciples to even master the content even better than they. So they would go on and teach others. But Jesus never expects us to fully master it. He is the master And he says he wants lifelong and total commitment. He said, the one who has found his life will lose it, and the one who has lost his life on my account will find it. Number three, what we learn about Jesus as a disciple maker, he called outsiders. Yes, Jesus had those 12 men, but we know that the early church had 120 people, men and women, who considered themselves disciples of Jesus. And I love that Jesus called all kinds of people, whether they were um, politically motivated, like Simon the Zealot, or not political at all. He called you know, people that grew up in Jewish traditions. He, he, he called tax collectors, people others wanted nothing to do with. I mean, he, he gathered men and women, disciples of all, of all kinds, not just a particular religious kind, but everybody. Number four, what do we learn about him as a disciple maker? He exposed his disciples to danger. This seemed, this seemed very intentional on his part. He knew that they would face persecution. He he said in Matthew 10, and you will be hated by all because of my name, but it is the, the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. Later in the same passage, Matthew 10, and don't be afraid of those who can kill the body but are unable to kill the soul. Rather, rather fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. So Jesus put them in situations they had to depend on him. This is not easy at least from an earthly safety standpoint. And number five, we also see that Jesus rewarded his disciples. Um, He talked about coming rewards for those who are faithful and obedient to him. Matthew 16, the son of man is going to come in the glory of his father with his angels and will then repay every person 
according to their deeds. Now, Jesus called lots of people to be his followers. And lots of people loved the idea of following Jesus, but didn't actually follow him. Like there, there's examples where Jesus would go to a guy and say, hey, come, come and follow me. And, and the guy said, well, you know, Jesus, I will, but I got, I got some business I gotta take care of. I mean, you know, I gotta be a good businessman. I gotta you know, make sure the, the bank account's where it needs to be. And then, and then after I get all that squared away, then I'll follow you. And Jesus said, you're not worthy to follow me. Or, or there was a time where he called another guy and he said, well, I got, I got some family stuff to take care of. I, 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 can't, I can't do that right now. And, and Jesus said, he's not worthy to follow me. In fact, there's one time Jesus was teaching what many considered a very hard teaching. He was talking about his body and his blood. And particularly for Jewish people, you, you don't touch anything that has to do with, with blood in that kind of way. And, and a lot of people just really struggle with that teaching that Jesus was giving. And Jesus looked at his disciples and said, do you, do you wanna go away with him? I love what Peter said. He was like, where would we go? You know, in you, we, we have the words of eternal life. And, and that is a challenge that's still true for us today. Do we believe that in Jesus, we have the words of eternal life? We are to be people of truth and people of truth follow Jesus as the source of truth. So at the most basic level, to be a disciple starts with following Jesus, both learning and following. Now, here's what we tend to do. We tend to want to pick one or the other, all right? I either want to learn from Jesus or being a follower, but a lot, of us, a lot of us don't do both. And if I could just make a generalization about us, and this would be true of most of the American church or the church in the West, we are pretty good at the learning part. We're not so good at the following part, the putting it into practice part. We, we love learning. We love to go to Bible studies. We love to listen to people talk to us about Jesus. We, we love to read books. We love to listen to podcasts, to watch YouTube videos. Like we, we love to stuff our, our brains with, with information about Jesus, truth. And, and that's good. That's, that's not a bad thing to do. We need truth. But if we're not careful, we can become bobbleheads. You know what a bobblehead is? You ever go into a game? You know this? We could do this the whole sermon, right? And most of these bobbleheads they give out free, they got these huge heads, right? Stuffed with all kinds of things. And, and if we're not careful, we're like, we're like Christian bobbleheads because bobbleheads have heads that move and feet that don't. And we got heads, big old fat bobble Christian heads. But Jesus wants us to take all that truth and, and move, put it into practice, put it into action. Following Jesus. All right, number two. A disciple, secondly, is being changed by the Spirit. Being changed by the Spirit. Again, Jesus said to his disciples, verse 19, follow me and I will make you. Now you might think, well, hold on. If, if he's saying he will make us, doesn't that mean that we should say that we're being changed by Jesus? And the answer is yes. That's not wrong theologically. But let's also admit the great transition that has happened between the time of the New Testament and the time in which we live. Because, you know, after Matthew chapter four, we know that Jesus went on to do more ministry, that he died on the cross for our sins, that we might be given the righteousness of God through him. We know that he died. We know that three days later, he rose again from the grave. We know that he made 40 days of resurrection appearances. And then he said, I'm gonna go to the Father, but it's to your advantage. Why is that to our advantage? You're leaving us. Jesus knows it's to your advantage because the Holy Spirit, the helper will come. And we live right now in the age of the Holy Spirit. See, these disciples followed the earthy Jesus. But what we see from the rest of the New Testament and from our lives today, we follow the exalted Jesus by his spirit. Did you know, this might sound like Captain Obvious, but did you know that Jesus is alive right now? And that he is ruling right now? And that he is reigning right now? And he changes our lives by his spirit. And we need to be careful that we don't treat Jesus like an idea more than a person to be followed. I love uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I've, I quote him every now and then, particularly with discipleship. And here's a lengthy quote that you have to read a couple times to fully get, but let me read it for you. Um, and this is what he says. 
An abstract Christology, a doctrinal system, a general religious knowledge on the subject of grace or on the forgiveness of sins, render discipleship superfluous, and in fact, they positively exclude any idea of discipleship, whatever, and are essentially inimical to the whole conception of following Christ. Let me pause. What he's basically saying is like, if we study Jesus like he's a, like a topic to be discovered or some chapter in a book to learn about, but it doesn't, it doesn't translate into actively following him, then there's a problem. So let's go back to the quote. With an abstract idea, it is possible to enter into a relationship of formal knowledge, to become enthusiastic about it, and perhaps even put it into practice, but it can never be followed in personal obedience. And here's the big line. Christianity without the living Christ is inevitably Christianity without discipleship. And Christianity without discipleship is always Christianity without Christ. I just wanna remind all of you today that, that you have the, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're born again, you have the Holy Spirit in you and you are serving the active, risen, reigning Jesus who is alive today in an exalted way. And he uses his spirit to change us. Now to talk about the Holy Spirit um, deserves a lot more time than we have today. But here's just a few ideas when we think about how the Holy Spirit changes us. A few things if you wanna write them down. Number one, he guides us into all the truth. Um, John chapter 16 says that, that, that when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. That was certainly important for the apostles who are writing what we now consider scripture. But that's true practically for us. He still guides us into the truth. We are people of truth. The spirit guides us into truth. Number two, this goes with it, he convicts us of sin. One of the key roles of the Holy Spirit is that when he comes, he will convict the world regarding sin and righteousness and judgment. This is not only true of the act of conversion where we're convicted of our sin and we repent and put our faith in Jesus, but it's true even today, decades after you give your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit still convicts you. He says, I know, Clay, I, mm, that right there. Now I can deny that, I can dismiss him, but the Holy Spirit's work is like a beach ball. You, you can try to hold it underwater, but it's gonna try to surface. And the Holy Spirit still convicts of sin today, which drives me towards the truth of the gospel. Number three, he illumines God's word to us. Um, 1 Corinthians 2, now we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. That, that's the thing, like you read this book and, and you can read this as a lost person, and this is like the most random group of stories and sayings, and you're going, I mean, this is interesting history, I guess, but I don't see why you guys are so infatuated with this book. But I don't know how to explain it other than to say, when I have the Holy Spirit in me, it, it just illumines the Word of God and, and seals it on my heart. And God speaks to me, speaks to you through His Word. The Holy Spirit illumines His Word. And number four, the Holy Spirit produces fruit to grow our intimacy with God and to resist evil. The Holy Spirit helps us to do that. I love thinking about the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. What, what grows out of a, a heart that is healthy in the Spirit of God? Well, the fruit of the Spirit, for one, what is that? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And I'm sure there's a whole list of other things that are all part of the fruit of the Spirit. If we walk in the Spirit of God, what will be produced in us is the Spirit of God. And I think that's so important because often discipleship is depicted like it's the Navy SEALs of the Christian life. Now, this is a select group of people who are tougher than everybody else and have more grit than everybody else and are more rigid with their schedules than everybody else. And, they, and we, we talk about discipleship like it's this white knuckled, like hold on to Jesus kind of experience. And, and that is not the way of Jesus. That's not to say that we don't need to be tough in our convictions and endure persecution and other things. But when you're following Jesus, and the Holy Spirit's working, what naturally comes out of you is love and joy, peace, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. And the longer we walk with Jesus, the more that should become natural to us. I love what Dallas Willard says. 
He says, discipleship is becoming the kind of person who does easily and routinely what Jesus said, what Jesus said. That's so important for all of us because we just need to constantly ask ourselves, is my life producing the fruit of the Spirit? Because if Jesus isn't the fruit, let me tell you, Jesus isn't the root. If he isn't the fruit, Jesus isn't the root. I was with uh, some good friends of mine who are pastors the other day. We were talking about just life and ministry. Um, five of us were in the room, two are African-American, three white guys. We're talking about a lot of race stuff. You know, that's obviously occupied a lot of our time and thought over the last few years. And uh, Crawford Loritz was in there. A lot of you know Crawford. And Crawford is like a walking Twitter account. I mean, everything he says is amazing. I mean, when he talks, I have like notebooks filled with just quotes and He's awesome, and um, he was talking about going down to the, the I think, the Justice Museum in, uh, down below Montgomery, Alabama a couple weeks ago and just experienced that, and we're just talking about that, and, um, and he was talking about, though, the difference between um, justice in the way of Jesus and justice in the way of the world, and here's what he said, I thought it was good. He said, justice without forgiveness is merely revenge. And that is the difference, isn't it? That's one of many examples where the, the fruit of your life in Jesus should be the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And that's how you know it's of Jesus. If not, it just looks good on the outside, but it's merely just the flesh. So if we're disciples of Jesus, we're following Jesus, we're being changed by the Spirit of God, and number three, we're committed to the mission of God. Jesus said to his disciples, look, guys, follow me, and I'm gonna turn you into something. What are you gonna turn us into? I'm gonna make you, amongst other things, fishers of people. You're good at catching fish. You know how to do it. You know how to, how to cast the net in the right way. You know how to go there the right, you, you, I, want, I want you to take all those skills and I want you to fish, if I could say it like that, for something much more valuable than, than actual fish, people. I wanna use you so that other people can experience the love and grace that I came to give them. And that's still true for us today, do you know that? That he wants us to be fishing for people. Now, we're not the Holy Spirit, I can't change a life, you can't change a life, but God wants us to not only be disciples, but disciple makers. And this is, I think, our next step as a church. How many of us are truly disciple makers? Not just disciples, but disciple makers. I think about the future of our church. What, what, if, what if God chooses to save 5,000 people and send them here to Johnson Ferry the next five years? You ever think about that? I mean, we're, we're praying for revival, renewal. We're in a city of what, almost 8 million people? That's nothing. But what if 5,000 new believers flooded this place the next five years? How many of you right now are able and equipped to disciple them? That should be our heart, that we see people come to Christ, they move from death to life, and then we are intentional about helping them to grow in the things of Jesus. Now, we're gonna talk about next week, more about the relational connection that is so important with this. But at a basic level, do you know how to fish for people? Helping them to grow in the things of Jesus. I mean, you, you would never have a baby, at least I've never done this, we've had three kids, I've never, you know, had the experience of my wife being pregnant and then we go to the hospital and we deliver one of our daughters and never once did Terika or I ever think about just leaving the daughter to the hospital, drive away and go, man, that was awesome. We should do that again sometime. That was fun. I wonder if something happened to him. I don't know. Let's go get some lunch. That was great. No, no, no. That, you would expect us to take the child home and to raise the child. Well, look, None of us are the Holy Spirit, but, but in a sense, when someone who hopefully we share the gospel with moves from death to life and they are born again, we don't leave them in the hospital and go, well, good luck. The pattern of the New Testament is that we are intentional about making disciples. So here's a question for all of us. What is your next step to becoming a disciple maker? What's your next step to becoming a disciple maker? There are lots of ways to do this as a church. There's a few I wanna to mention to you. So in the back of this book, uh, there's not page numbers, but right near the back on this blue page, 
There are a couple of different ways that I think are a great next step for some of you. Some of you, that's getting involved in a connect group. That's a great first step. If you're not already connected, that's a, certainly a place where disciple making can happen. We're also gonna be starting something this year called 419 groups. Guess where we got that? From Matthew 419. 419 groups, uh, where it's an intentional strategy to help you become a disciple maker. We have an interest meeting coming up. If you wanna learn more, I think there's some information. There's something as simple as an email address. I think it's 419 at jfbc.org. Just say, hey, I'm interested. We're gonna respond to all those this week. We also have some folks out of the tables in the atrium today. Uh, Go by there, learn about ways to become a disciple maker. You might think, well, a thousand relational disciple makers, honestly, that's not that much. I mean, don't we have like thousands of people here every Sunday until you learn what it means to be a disciple maker, which does take time and sacrifice and commitment and intentionality and relationships and accountability. And we're gonna need God's help for us to make that the leading edge of ministry for our church. And I hope and pray that we'll all do that. But if you never give your life to Christ, that's really the next step for you, to become a disciple. So what's the disciple? Disciple is one who is following Jesus, being changed by the Spirit, and committed to the mission of God. Let's pray together. Jesus, we love you and thank you for this mission that you've given to us. I pray that, Lord, not only would we be your disciples, but God, we would be disciple makers, and you would help us by your Spirit to do that which you've called us to do. Lord, if there's anyone here today in either of our rooms, anyone watching online right now, who cannot confidently say that they're a follower of Jesus, would today be the day that they would repent of their sin and put their faith in you as both Savior and Lord. Lord, we love how you're working the lives of people. We're so excited, God, to think about these that are being baptized this morning. What a wonderful picture of life change. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that we get to be a part of your mission. We love you, Jesus. And it's your name we pray. Amen.